circumstances is when the French really suffer. And they'll suffer at the end of the 14th century, they'll suffer at the middle of the 15th century. I'm sorry, the English will suffer. Cliff, did you want to respond to that? I agree. Okay. Um, I think there's one up there, or did you have a follow-up to that? And then one up there, and then we'll take one of these front ones, and then we have to get our speakers to the reception over here. Do you think that the figure on your slide that detailed Brusico's plan at Ashford of um, 5,000 English foreign women to 900 English men at arms is accurate? Um, I mean, I've heard a, a ranging thing. I think uh, 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 it sometimes goes up to 7,000 archers, doesn't it? 7,000 archers, but it's around 9, 950 um, uh, um, uh, the men at arms that are said to be there. The pay roles that Anne Curry has been working on, where she differs with Cliff, and I really shouldn't be the one to oppose to this because you, you've clearly done more research on it than I have, would suggest a much higher number of men at arms. And so, we always think that half the men at arms drop out in the march across Normandy, and so they had 2,000, so we go down to 950. But, but does that discrepancy in numbers speak to the efficacy of the longbow itself? Uh, I don't know whether Anne suggests that in her book. I'm, I'm not going to take that on because I'm not sure about the numbers in that regard. Um, you could Clear. probably yeah. yeah, I think the numbers of, of 900, 1,000 men at arms, 5,000 archers are solid, you know, I mean, you know, plus or minus, right. plus precise. Um, I don't think, I mean, I think that partly, yes, that does reflect the efficacy of the archers. The fact that Henry the, the V thought that he could go traipsing across France with only 1,000 men at arms and 5,000 other soldiers. Oh, well, uh, I, but he may have started out with, if, if we lost, if he loses half the no, march, no, he, he starts lose, out no, with no, 2,000. No, 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 that, he loses a lot, not on the march, but at the siege of Marseille. Yeah, in March, March is small. One of the one of the questions that I ask about the Ashford campaign, and there are a flurry of books, none of which have really answered this. And I haven't actually talked to a nutrition historian, um, and as I was obese myself for a few, for, until recently, I clearly was not an authority on this. But um, why is it that men at arms do drop out of dysentery, but the archers just peel off their pants and keep going? Well, I don't think it is true. I mean. And argues that the rate of dysentery was much higher among the um, the men at arms, and this is from the siege of Harfleur. But she basically argues that because there are a lot more documented cases of men at arms being sent back to England, I don't think that's okay. because they got no. sick more. I think that's because it got written down more when they got sick because they were important people. Yeah, I hate to cut that argument off, but we're going to have to move. Jimmy, was there one back? In the back, the question back there, and then one more. I think you had one. So that one, and then that one, and we should be fairly brief about the way we answer. If there's one thing that Hollywood movies teach me about medieval archers is that they're all able to fire in one large volley after another. Now, I might ask you this question: Is that true? Would archers actually fire in volley and then volley again and volley again, or would they have more of a firing on their own at a kind of a rate uh, that each archer kind of determines? Like how would that kind of support your particular positions? And that's for both of you. Well, but there are, from Agincourt specifically, there are a number of descriptions that indicate volley fire, um, clouds darkening the sun. You know, that's not going to happen with fire at will. Um, I, I suspect that as you know, the range got short, people just started plugging away at whoever was coming near them. Yeah. I would say the same thing. We do have accounts uh, where, by the way, you know, the Turks flood the air with uh, with archery as well, and, and you know, I mean, so this is a total <coughs> among most most of them. But it, it, the one battle where we can be secure about this, if, because the archaeology and the um, and literary um, um, evidence um, match, is Towton, where the Lancastrians move their archers forward, fire one volley. And it hits the, the York archers, and they're, they appear to be in a line at this point. The York archers, who have the wind and the snow blowing in their faces, then volley, and it falls short. The Lancastrians then volley again, and the Yorks, Yorkist archers say, you know, F this, I'm out of here. And they, they're gone. So we've got three shots, all in volley, and they found a line of, of um, arrowheads. In, in town that could be equated to the short shots. 
um, of the orcas. So, uh, under those <coughs> circumstances, if we accept them, because the archaeology is now um, uh, is now giving evidence to the literary works, we have very few shots fired until the other side runs or charges, and then we have also uh, volley fire. Cliff, did you want to add anything? Yeah. One last question. Um, this morning when we were doing the archery demonstration of the quad, they mentioned that um, even in sparring, sometimes they would hit each other with the swords and it would cause like, you know, they would either bruise, it wouldn't be a cut, but it would, it would cause them considerable pain. What kind of velocity would the arrows be hitting at? Even if they weren't lethal, would it be enough to disorient and um, affect the battle in that way, even if they weren't death shots? Yes, I, I think so. It would definitely be bruising and damaging. Now, some people have done these things. Oh, you know, it says in the Journal of Modern Traumatology that an 80, Senate, 80 yeah. joule blunt force trauma is lethal. You know, that's not, that's not right. But, um, there is a, a very good quotation to that effect, a pretty long ago even, um, where from this, the, the Siege of Bruges in 1128, where there's an archer named Benkin, who is distinguishable from the other archers, because although his arrows will not penetrate the armor of the knights, it forces them to flee stunned and bruised. So. And, and I think a lot of that, uh, I mean, one of the problems with the Defense Academy trials, Mark Stratton, and Dave Lutton and others did, is that they, did in their effectiveness quotient, whatever, where they decided, they determined that anybody who had been hit was now disabled and could not go on. And that's just simply not the case. Um, uh, you know, they, they often, we often have examples of individuals who fight on, uh, and, and that happens in modern warfare as, as well. I think adrenaline, I think the, the need to, to survive and other things like this, we've got military individuals inside, would suggest that um, individuals feel a lot of the bruises and others afterwards. But and the nature of an arrow wound is, is that as wounds go, it's not, it, unless it goes through an organ, it's not that bad. Right. Because uh, it sort of plugs its own hole and. Uh, there, there, there are great descriptions of uh, Pero Nino in uh, a chronicle written by a standard bearer fighting in a battle where he wasn't against English and he didn't get hit by longbows, but he did get hit by some crossbow bolts. And you know, one went through his nose, and he was like, oh, I hardly noticed it until some guy, I was so close to some guy that he bit it, and then it really hurt, you know. Uh, but I was just fighting. The bite, not the... the yeah. No, no, the crossbow bolt. Oh, the crossbow yeah. bolt did. Well, yeah, and, and we've got other examples, too. That there's some wonderful um, uh, stories and sagas about individuals. One guy gets a spirit of scrotum, and he's disabled from that battle, but he sits, he, he, he takes his pants off, sits in the snowbank so the, the blood will stop, and then he comments on the rest, like your mother wears army boots type of comments with the, this battle between seven and seven. So, you know, I think, and, and I think also pre-modern people are probably a little hardier then we tend to be under these circumstances because it was life was a little more difficult. Joan Bark is wounded twice. She and well, she's wounded three times really. One one does not go through the armor, uh, and she returns to battle after having a wound through the shoulder at uh, at the siege of Orleans. But Henry, and she returns the next day. Henry V, when he was just Prince Hal at the Battle of Shrewsbury. And by the way, I think this experience is probably part of why he felt confident traipsing around France with a bunch of longbowmen, is he had actually been shot by a longbow arrow. It's a it arrow. No, it's a longbow arrow. Oh. And it hit him, no, I'm, I'm quite sure, and it hit him in the face, on the side of his nose, and went in and stuck in the back of his skull. And uh, there's a, we have his physician's report of how he got the arrow out, which was that he spent like a month inserting splints and widening the wounds a little bit every day until it was wide enough that he could take a little device he had made which looked like a, a pair of ice tongs with a screw that he could then insert into the wound, put the tongs on the head of the arrowhead, screw it tight, work it out, pull it out, and then for like a month close up the wound. Um, so, and by the way, Henry's Oh, but, but I'm sorry, I didn't get to the, the punchline of that, which is that having taken that arrow, he still thought out the battle. 
And, and, it, and his portrait is the only one that has one side on it. Right, it's a, it's a profile portrait. portrait. Because, because the other side is probably a mess. And on that grisly note, we should...